How many of you could testify today and say, uh, Jesus got a hold of my life? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jesus saved me. That's an, you know, that's an old-fashioned gospel word. I know, maybe to us, you know, a lot of us that are older, that's not old-fashioned. That's, that's a common word of the gospel and church and everything we grew up with. I got saved, you know. And pastors used to preach about getting saved and all that. And now we've kind of gotten a little kinder and gentler. And uh, you don't hear that word as often as you do, but that's exactly what the Scripture describes happens when Jesus comes into our life. He saves our soul, and our life is never the same again. Christ comes, and he saves us. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, and our life is never the same again. No, it can't be. And, and last week, uh, I started, I really kind of started this uh, series that I'll be in now for the next few weeks on uh, the fruit of the Spirit. I know I mentioned it last week about the fruitfulness in your life and what God's doing and, and how the Holy Spirit b produces in our life certain fruit that, um, that become not just what we do, but what we are. And, and, it, and it's the character of Christ recreated in our life. And, and I, I wanted to share with you a, 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 pa a couple of passages. I know a lot of times, and many of you that have been in church for a long time, and you've uh, been through the fruit and so forth, I just wanted to, before, you know, we always put, I always put this passage up on the screen, and it's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And it says, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, or self-control. Against such there is no law. But I just wanted you to see, one time at least, the verses that come before those verses. All right. All right. <laughs> All right? And what you're going to see is you're going to see the Apostle Paul sending to the church at Galatia and saying, now, what I want to show you is the contrast between what the flesh can do and what the Spirit can do. And so let me just read, ver verse. this is verse 19 and 20 and 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are... Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I told you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if this is your lifestyle, he's just telling you you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God if that pretty much describes how you live your life. And then, but the fruit of the Spirit, those were the fruit of the flesh. This is the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the, the, the Apostle Paul's telling us now that there's a difference between trying to live a life that elevates you by, um, uh, by somehow following the law, living the law, uh, doing the law, uh, uh, settling things for yourself because the flesh is so powerful the works of the flesh are drunkenness and fornication and adultery and lewdness and acts of dissension. I mean, just heresies, sedition, all of those things. That's what the flesh produces in life. And so our soul is changed not by keeping the flesh under control, but by the indwelling power of, of Jesus Christ in our life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and kindness and faith and meekness and temperance. So, so the book of Galatians is about the battle between the flesh and the Spirit and how uh, trying to control the flesh and live by the flesh and, and crucify the flesh in the flesh is not going to work. It takes the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working within us to change our soul and make a difference in our life so that we are saved <laughs> by the Spirit of God. So even a cursory reading of the New Testament would tell you that um, Christians, and I, I, I know I don't even need to say this to you, that that Christians are supposed to reflect Christ, that that is what it means to be a Christian. As a matter of fact, the word Christian means little Christ. And the word was not used by Christians themselves first. 
It's kind of an interesting little deal about this in the book of Acts chapter 11, if you want to read that when you get home. Uh, the church is moving out to a place called Antioch. The, the Spirit of God and the, Christ, and, and, the, and the Christian Spirit, the Holy Spirit's moving the church. The book of Acts is, it shows us how uh, the Spirit of God goes from a little upper room in, Bethlehem, uh, in Jerusalem where the disciples are endued with power and how it, it goes out into the world and that the church fills the earth. And it's going to a place called Antioch. And as the, as the Christian believers from Jerusalem uh, go to Antioch, they begin to establish a church. And the, it was the citizens of Antioch who looked at them as they went out and said about them, uh, these people are obviously Christians, you know, Christians. They're little Christ. So it, it wasn't that the church got together and decided in a business meeting somewhere, you know, I think, all right, we're going to be Baptists and we're going to be Methodists. We're going to be Episcopalian. Some of us are going to be Lutheran, Catholic. We're going to be, no, no, it was, it was a lost world, citizens of a lost city and a lost world that looked at the Christians and said of them, they are obviously uh, Little Christ, they remind us of, of, of the one who walked through this land and did all of those great things and taught us about all of the great, you know, spiritual truths. And, and so these are obviously little Christ. And so in Galatians, in the book of Galatians, it's written to combat um, the legalizers and, and those who would come and say, it's all right to be saved by grace. But in order to stay saved, in order to live like God wants you to do, you got you to gotta live up to the demands of the law. And so uh, Paul says, no, 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 it's not the demand. It's not, it's not living a good life. It's not crucifying a fleshy life. It's not doing good things to counterbalance bad things that might, have, might, might be. It is an indwelling spirit of God that saves my soul and keeps my soul saved and keeps me in proper relationship with God. So the reason the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us is that the Holy Spirit wants to recreate Jesus Christ in our lives. And as Jesus Christ is recreated in our lives, then when we go out into the world, the world obviously sees a difference between what their world represents and what we're living, and, and they see Jesus Christ living in us. It was just like, like Lily said about, the, uh, about what they were teaching the young people this past week, that we go out and that we represent Christ, and that when we go out and represent Christ, people see Jesus in us, and people are attracted to Jesus, and people are attracted to the, to the, to the kingdom and to the gospel because of what they see lived out of our life. So we see that the purpose of the Holy Spirit ministering inside of us is to recreate Jesus Christ here on this earth. While Jesus was on the earth, Jesus did great things. Jesus did miracles. And as he did miracles, the kingdom of God was exalted and elevated. And people said, this is amazing. I can't believe. And, and they were amazed by the gifts that Jesus used and, and, and the miracles that Jesus did. But not only were they impressed by the gifts that Jesus had and the miracles that he did, they were impressed by what Jesus was, and that is his character. So in our lives, there are, there are two um, vehicles by which the Holy Spirit works in our life. One are the gifts, and one are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, I said, mentioned to you, and I know many of you have been through uh, teachings, and I've taught many times on the gifts and the fruit, but just to say it so that everybody will be aware, uh, a lot of times when you talk about gifts and fruits, people just get them interchanged. They, it's almost like, well, the, the gifts and the fruits are the same thing, but the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit are not the same thing. The gifts and the fruit are, are very different. The gifts are a manifestation of what Jesus did, in other words, God gives gifts to us. The Holy Spirit gives gifts to us. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about how the Holy Spirit gives to us gifts by which we operate when we are gifted by him. And it's the Holy Spirit that decides what gift we get, when we get it, how it operates, and what we do. It's completely left to the Holy Spirit as to giftedness. When you receive a gift, you receive it immediately, by the way. 
like one that you would receive if I had a gift for you and I handed it to you as soon as you had it, uh, as soon as you took it, you would have received the gift. So the gifts are given to you and they are immediate. The fruit of the Spirit is um, like, like it implies, it, it, it's like a seed that gets planted inside you, and then it takes time for that seed to grow and to, and to begin to produce this fruit in my life. So gifts may be immediate, but fruit take time to grow. And, and I'm saying this to you because I know as we go through these gifts and you're going to see them and you're going to see how they operate and function in your life, uh, you, you're going to be just a little bit, I think, discouraged at times because you'll be looking at your own life and you'll be saying, man, I'm, I'm, I'm far from that. And uh, I just want to tell you, don't be discouraged because what happens with God's work in our life is the Holy Spirit comes in and he plants himself in our life and, and, and he plants this fruit in our life. And as we grow and mature toward the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit grows and matures out of our life. I know before I've, I've, I've heard people speak of this, and I, I know I've spoken of it and, and gave the indication, I'm sure, that somehow the fruit of the Spirit are ways that we learn how to act. Now, I don't, I don't want you to come away with that. The, the fruit of the Spirit is not just learning how to do certain things, like how to be joyful or how to be loving or how to be uh, sacrificing or how to live under control. This is not something that you learn how to do. This is something that God does in you. God does this inside of you. And if the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, the Holy Spirit is going to be producing these great things uh, as the Lord works in your life. And so as God produces these great gifts in our life, we'll see them and we'll see how God activates them. I want to make a couple of points before we get into the first one, which is uh, the greatest, obviously. Uh, it's the very first one on the list. And it is the most obvious to the world when you have it and when you don't have it. And it's love. But I want to, want to just make a couple of observations. First is, you'll notice, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. Uh, and all of you English majors, I'm sure that you're aware of this, but the uh, verb is is a singular verb, right? Which means that it denotes that it's going to talk about one thing. But you'll notice after it says the fruit of the Spirit is, it lists nine things there that the fruit of the Spirit is. Now, I think a case could be made, um, representing the premise that there is only one fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then the eight descriptions there are the eight descriptions of how love acts and the eight personalities of love. But I don't want you to be worried about that because we're going to cover all nine of them anyway. I just wanted to mention to you that there, are, there is something about that. Let me give you one little interesting thing you can do. I started to do it, excuse me, on the screen for you. But it would just take too much time and, and, and all of that. But, but, but you can do this, and if you'll just write this in a little note somewhere, and you can, when you go home, just take, do this. Take the fruit of the Spirit, which are listed here. There are nine of them that are listed here, or maybe one with uh, eight different flavors, you know, whatever. But, but there are nine of them, nine, nine descriptions, characteristics that are listed. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. How many of you are aware that 1 Corinthians 13 is the greatest description of love that has ever been given? And we're going to look at it, by the way, today. Uh, so uh, I saw some of you breathe hard. 16 descriptions of love. 1 Corinthians 13 is 16 different descriptions of what love is. And we'll hit all of them. I'm looking at the clock right now. And uh, I know you're thinking, he can't do that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give it a shot, all right? <laughs> I'm going to give it a little. I'm going to have to move quickly, but I'm going to give it a little shot. But what, I, what, what you can do is you can take the nine fruit of the Spirit that are listed here, and you can read 1 Corinthians 13, those 16 descriptions of love that we'll look at today, and you can ap apply each one of these nine fruit. Uh, the 16 descriptions fit these nine fruit that are mentioned here. It's just amazing how that happens. Um, and so love is a tremendous blessing a tremendous power in our life. And so uh, first observation is that. Second little observation is 
that the fruit, I don't know if you kind of notice it, some of you that might group things together, you might have noticed this, that there seems to be uh, about three groups up here in these nine fruit, and they're listed in, in clusters of three. Uh, there is the inward fruit, which is what the Holy Spirit does inside of me that affects me, myself, personally, and that's love, joy, and peace is what he does on the inside of me. And then there's the outward fruit, the fruit that affects other people that we're around or that we deal with or our family, and that is long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. And then there's the upward fruit, which is in my relationship with God, and that is faith, meekness, which means humility, pretty much, and self-control. But uh, be that as it may, uh, I want to look at the first, the first gift that's mentioned here, the, the foundation and he says, the fruit of the Spirit is, is love. When Jesus was asked by a scribe in Mark chapter 12, what, what is the greatest commandment of all? You remember what Jesus said to him? Jesus said that you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he said, and the second commandment is like unto it, and that is that you would love your neighbor as yourself. I just wanted you to notice that in the greatest commandment, that Jesus said it's the greatest commandment, that love is the key to that. And so we can surmise by that, that love is, is the most important thing in the world to God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that it is. In 1 Corinthians 13, the last verse 13, it says, and now abide faith, hope, and love but the greatest of these is love. So why is love the greatest? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak, first verse, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, which means that gifts without love are just noise. The Apostle Paul is saying, if I could communicate in languages like men communicate in, or I could communicate in languages like angels communicate in, whatever that kind of language may be, if at the root of my communication there is no love, then I am like sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Everybody just say noise, noise. If I would go over here on this drum set, if it was out here where I could get to it, and I could get a, a drumstick, and I'd start beating on that cymbal, and it'd be, tsh, 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 tsh. how many of you would like to buy a CD with that on? No, that wouldn't be anything. Why? Because it's just, it's, it's just noise. It's indiscriminate. It has no rhythm. It has no melody. It, it has no distinction to it at all. It is just noise in the house. And the Apostle Paul is telling us now that the giftedness that we have if we are not controlled by love, all of the giftedness that we might have in our life have no value at all because there is no distinction to those gifts if there's not love. So, so the root of all giftedness in my life has to be controlled by love or the gift becomes reckless and, and out of control and dangerous. So every gifted person has to guard their character because if your character is not is not controlled by love, no matter what gift you might have, the Apostle Paul says that it's, no, it, it, it's a zero. It's, I, I had a pastor once that said zero, which means uh, a zero with the rim knocked off of it. You are, it is nothing at all. All of that giftedness that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, miracles and healings and words of knowledge and words of wisdom and faith and all of the giftedness that's mentioned there is totally worthless, the Apostle Paul says, without love, because without love, gifts are just noise. Second thing, and though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Discernment is validated by love. To validate something means to uh, show that it's alive, to show that it's, that it's right. So he says, prophecy, mysteries, and knowledge. Prophecies, mystery, and knowledge 
deal with the discernment of the Spirit in my life. Prophecies give me the ability to discern the future. Mysteries give me the, discern, the ability to discern hidden things in life. Uh, knowledge gives me the ability to discern the unknown. And according to the Apostle Paul, if I don't have love in my life, all of those wonderful uh, opportunities of giftedness in my life uh, have, no, have no fruit at all. Uh, to be disqualified because you don't have love is a tremendous thing. Love is a very powerful. Words of knowledge, words of knowledge are, are things that the Lord tells you that you don't know. I know that some of you, uh, when you read your, your Bible, you've read the story of the Apostle Paul, and he's in the book of Acts, and Ananias and Sapphira have sold some land, and they come into the church, and they come down to the altar, and they stand before the church, and they say, they say, we've sold some land, and we want to bring all the money and give it to the church. And the Apostle Paul, I mean, Peter says, uh, uh, is this all the money that you have? And he said, oh yeah, this is all the money we have. And then Peter looks at him and says, uh, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And immediately they fall dead at the altar at church. That was a great day at church, wasn't it? I mean, can you imagine what they said when they went home after church that day? Didn't make anybody want to come lie at the altar again. But anyway, that's a word of knowledge. Uh, there was no way for Peter to know that except that the Holy Spirit would tell him about that. But even that type of thing, as great as it is, the Apostle Paul tells us that if I have, all, if I have the gift of prophecy and mysteries and knowledge and I don't have love, I am nothing. The third verse, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. So he starts in verse 2 with, I have all faith so that I can move mountains. So all of my convictions are shallow without love. He's building a case here to say why love is the greatest of all things. My gifts, are, my, my gifts don't matter without, if, if I don't have love in my life because if love is not at the center of my life, all of my gifts are going to be reckless and out of control. They're not going to accomplish what God has sent them to, to accomplish. They're going to be self-serving and, and, and self-elevating in life. And then all of, my, all of the, the great discernment that I might have, God's not going to tell me anything. God's not going to show me anything if my life is not controlled by love. Because if God showed it to me, what would I do with it? I'd probably use it to hurt someone, harm someone, or elevate myself in some way. And then he says, oh, even if you have great conviction in your life, you have all faith so that you could move mountains. And he says, and though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. So if I have all faith to move mountains, and I have these wonderful gifts so that I can speak in the tongues of men and of angels, and I operate in all of the wonderful gifts, and I can do miracles, and I can speak wonders, and I can perform all of these things, and and I'm completely benevolent, and I'm completely sacrificial uh, so that I would, would give everything I have for the poor and even burn myself, uh, set myself on fire, for the burn for the glory of God. Even though I have all of that and I have not love, it profits me nothing. I guarantee you, if I could walk into this room and I would stand up here before you and I would be able to look at a mountain and I could say, all right, mountain, move, and it would move you would be impressed. Or if I walked in here and I could start spouting out some of the great mysteries of life. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why hadn't you answered my prayer? <laughs> all of these mysterious things that we all want to, what is my purpose in life? Why did you create me, God? And I could just answer all of those wonderful mysteries of life. Boy, you'd be impressed. Or if I could come in here and, 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 and I would be... Uh, uh, I would have money in my pocket that I could just, everybody that had, get, had uh, owed bills and, and had debts and I could just start handing out money and pay all of your bills for you, you would be impressed. And if I, if I could, after all of that, just somehow ignite myself so that I would begin to burn and radiate for the glory of God, 
and I would just be a tremendous testimony for the glory of God, you'd be impressed. But Paul says, though I can do all of these things and I don't have love, my life is not, not, not dominated and, 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 and controlled by love. I'm nothing. Which tells me that God's not easily impressed. And that, and that, that God measures on a different scale than we do. And he says that love is the most important of all. So let's see how you're doing in the area of love in your life. All right? You want to see that? I know that I asked you before we started, I said, how many of you could say right now, and I'm not asking you to raise your hand, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, but you could say right now, uh, God has got a hold of my life. Jesus Christ uh, controls my life. Jesus is my Lord. He's my master. He's my savior. And Jesus lives on the inside of me and the Holy Spirit has filled my life. You could say that this morning. I asked you about that. And the reason I ask you is because once that is true, then all of these fruit begin to grow in our lives. And, and, and so let's just look at the foundation of all of them, the, fa the foundation of love, and let's just see how we're doing. There's 16, by the way, 16 attributes of love. So uh, take a deep breath and let's just see if we can go. First, the first, first it says love suffers long. Can you put up with things? I mean, can you walk in discomfort? You can't be a person that, that gives up and quits and falls away. No matter how much you're disrespected, no matter how much you're, <laughs> you're hurt, no matter how much you're blasted. I know all of you parents with children that are about 13, 14, 15 right in there. You're all going, oh, my Lord, I know how to suffer long. <laughs> Love suffers long. Second thing it says, love is kind. Are, are you kind? Quick to be compassionate, uh, gentle, uh, inclined to be nice, uh, easy to get along with. I've had people tell me before that they loved me, but they weren't kind to me. So if you tell me that, you're lo that you love me and you're not kind to me, then I can look at you and say, liar, liar, pants on fire. Tough love, yeah, tough love. So I'm telling you that if somebody tells you that they love you and they're not kind to you, what that means is their love is incomplete. And when it is complete, it'll be kind because love is kind. Love does not envy. Envy means to want something that's not yours. Now, there are two words that we often use together or we say them a lot together as if they mean the same thing, but they don't mean the same thing. And the words are jealousy and envy. Jealousy is when I am concerned about something that belongs to me. Like the Bible tells us that God is jealous. Is jealous after us. In other words, we belong to God. And when we give ourselves to this world, the Bible says that God, that God is a jealous God. And as a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, it tells us that God's name is jealous. And so when I am concerned about something that belongs to me and I'm concerned about what happens to it, I would be jealous. But to envy means that I want something that doesn't belong to me. I look at your life and I want what you have simply because you have it and I want it. When you can't celebrate someone else's success, it's envy that keeps you from doing that. The Bible says love does not envy. Number four, love does not parade itself, which is really basically dealing with the fact that love prefers others over itself. There's a passage in Philippians that says what? That Jesus Christ, that we should strive to live like Jesus in that Jesus did not think it was something to be grasped for, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And so our striving in our life is that we would prefer others better than ourselves, which is not an encouragement to have low self-esteem, by the way. It's just a, it's an encouragement to prefer others above ourselves. In other words, love's not a Mimi bird. How many of you have ever had lunch with a Mimi bird? Oh, yeah. You know what that is? 
That's somebody that no matter what you've done, me's done something better. Right? So love's not a Mimi bird. So love is not puffed up. Love does not have an attitude. It's not overinflated. It's not excessive. Love is not arrogant. People that are excessive and arrogant are easily bruised, aren't they? Why? Because, well, as the Bible says, good, good word to describe it, they're puffed up. So love is not puffed up. Number six, love doesn't act inappropriately. Love does not behave rudely. Love doesn't show off is what that's really talking about. It doesn't act inappropriately. It doesn't get out of order. Love is appropriate. Love won't have you working in an altar with a dress up to here or your shirt down to here. And Why? Because that's inappropriate. Love acts appropriately. Love does not get out of boundaries. Love does not get out of control. Number seven, love embraces the unlovable. Love does not seek its own. It doesn't seek only the people who love it. One of the, one of the problems that we have with people is that we generally are drawn to love people who love us. And the people that we don't get along with generally are people that don't love us. Love can love the unlovable because we are called to minister to those people who are in crisis, those people who are in desperate need. So as a child of God, I'm going to have to be able to love people who don't love me. One thing I've noticed about sick people is that sick people are not usually very nice. They're not, they're, 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 they're tough, they're hard to deal with. And whenever I, you deal with someone who is not nice or is unlovable in life, what you want to do as a person is you want to, you know, bow up against that and crack your neck, you know, when they say something you want and, and say, what, what, what did you say to me? But what love does is love reaches down and love just apprehends my flesh because love is, love can love the unlovable. Number eight. Love is not easily provoked. Now, I want you to notice here that it doesn't say that love can't be provoked. It just says that love is not easily provoked. I've been around people that have claimed to know Christ for 20 years, and they're just as childish as they can possibly be. Almost anything upsets them and knocks them off course. And, and it's almost like you've been saved too long to get upset that quickly. Love doesn't act that way. Love is not easily provoked. Number nine, number nine, love doesn't think the worst. Love thinks no evil. Love is not quick to conjure up evil, thinking the worst of everything, thinking the worst of everybody. An old evil mind, <laughs> an old evil mind. You know, every time something comes up, it just jumps immediately to the most... Uh, carnal thoughts and, 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 and lewd examples. Titus, Paul wrote a, a, a letter to Titus and in the first chapter he said to Titus, he said, uh, I want to tell you, Titus, the, to the pure, all things are pure, but to them who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. And so uh, an evil mind needs to be regenerated, needs to be, needs to be reclaimed. And those people who think evil things are evil in life. And love doesn't think evil thoughts and evil things. Number 10, love doesn't get glad about bad stuff. It does not rejoice in, iniqui in, in iniquity. Love does not get glad when pain comes to, to, to someone that, we're, uh, that we deal with. I... I I think about, when I think about this, about, about not getting glad about bad stuff, I think about, uh, in the Old Testament, Samuel, the prophet. Samuel was sent to King David. You remember, I mean, not King David, he was sent to Saul. And you remember Saul, God had taken the kingdom away from Saul. And he sent Samuel, the prophet, to tell Saul that the kingdom had been taken away from him. And so Samuel goes in representing God and speaking as the man of God. He goes in and, and, he, and he says to Saul, Saul, 
Uh, God has sent me to tell you that he's taken the kingdom away from you and he's going to give it into the hands of another. And, and, and Saul reaches out and, and grabs Samuel's robe and, and holds on. And as Samuel pulls back, it tears, it tears Samuel's high priestly robe. And, and uh, Samuel looks at Saul and says, uh, just as you've torn my robe, God is tearing the kingdom from your hands. And then Samuel leaves, and he goes to his home, and he gets in the corner of his home, and he just starts weeping. And he just starts weeping and weeping about the fact that God was taking the kingdom away from Saul. And, as a matter of, and then he weeps so long that finally God has to speak to him, and God has to say to him, Samuel, how long are you going to weep about this? Seeing that it wasn't you that took the kingdom away from him, but it was me that took the kingdom away from him. And so God had to go and get Samuel out of his depression over the fact that Saul had lost the kingdom. Love doesn't get glad when others get hurt in life. It doesn't rejoice over bad stuff. Love gets glad about the truth. In other words, love gets excited about the word. It gets excited about people's lives being changed. It gets excited about people growing in the Lord. It gets excited about the good things that happens in people's lives. So it doesn't get glad about bad stuff, but it does get glad about the truth. Love carries the load. Love bears all things. Love, love carries these, this heaviness in our life. How many of you have ever had to bear a load, a heavy load? You know... A lot of people bear load, heavy loads in marriage. They bear heavy loads with their children, they, their job. Uh, when God somehow initiates a load in your life, uh, possibly God is, is placing something in your life that can, uh, that can help you understand himself. I, I, I've thought about this from time to time, about good people and bad things happening in their lives and having to carry heavy loads of that happen in, in emotional pain and some a lot in physical pain. And, and I think, God, what could, what could come out of these things that would be of any benefit in our life or be a blessing? And, and, it, and it just dawned on me that many times we're placed in situations that help us understand how God looks at our life and how we treat God. Many times God will put us in an unloving situation where somebody's not loving us appropriately and, and not loving us responsibly and not loving us right. No matter how well we treat them, no matter how good we are to them, and they still don't treat because we need to, we can learn that this is somehow this is sometimes this is how we do God and that God given us all things and God has loved us and God says, you know, this is how it feels in, in me so that we can look at God and say, God, if I ever made you feel this way, God, forgive me. I repent. I'm sorry. So love bears all things. Love hopes all things. In other words, love has positive expectations. Um, love is faith-filled. Because it's faith-filled, it means that it's positive. Love is, love is a flowing fountain. It's not a stagnant pool. People that are loving are giving people. They are flowing people. Uh, they're not stingy. They're not negative. Um, they, are, they are giving in life. And so love in our life causes us to have hope for all things and have positive expectations about life. Number 14, love is optimistic about the future. Love is optimistic about the future because it's, it's full of hope. I know we talk about hope a lot and we say, we hope you have a good day. We hope you have a good life. Hope everything goes wrong with you. And a lot of times what we do is we interchange the word hope for the word wish. We wish you the best. We wish you good fortune or whatever it might be. But to hope is not a wish. The word hope, and I know I've said this to you, and I don't want to strain in a gnat and swallow a camel, but the word hope means a well-founded, well-grounded expectation of the future. 
In other words, if I'm hoping for something, it means that I have a reason to hope for something. It's not just an indiscriminate wish. You know, I, I wish it would be good. I, I wish you a good day. No, it means there's a reason why I believe that, that what I'm expecting is going to happen. There's a, there's a reason for that. Now, is there a reason for us as Christians and, and, and is there a reason for love to believe that things are going to be better for people in life? Well, sure, because the word is filled with all of these great promises. If God be for us, then who can be against us? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What can separate us from the love of God? Height and depth and nothing can separate us from the love of God. We're conquerors and more than conquerors through him who loves us. So love makes us optimistic. Uh, no matter how bad it may look, I can look and say, we're going to make it. <laughs> I believe God's going to tear us through. Why? All things are possible through Christ. We're more than conquerors. I can do all things through him. God is for me and not against me. I'm the head and not the tail. I mean, there are m bunches of promise in the word that tells me that I can be optimistic about the future no matter what I'm going through in life because whether I've got to push you or pull you or carry you, we may have to carry each other across the, the, the goal line. God's given us a promise that he's not going to leave us and that we can make it in life. So love is uh, very optimistic about the future. Love endures everything. Paul tells Timothy, the way we're supposed to live in life is to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, how do you live as a good soldier for Jesus Christ? It means to endure hardness and don't let your face move. How many of you have seen the guards at Buckingham Palace on TV or in a picture or whatever? Have you, ever, have you ever watched them? Have you ever been, have you ever, you, you probably could go on YouTube or any of those other things. You could see it. And you can see people just go up there and they do everything they can possibly do to those guards besides touch them to make them lose their stoic forward look. I mean, it is the essence of a soldier to be focused on the battle and to be focused on his orders. When, Jesus, when Paul tells Timothy that you are to endure hardness as a good soldier, he's saying what, what, what God expects from you is that you would endure whatever hardness there is without letting your face move. In other words, I shouldn't be able to look at your face and tell what's going on in your life. In the book of Proverbs, it says we are snared by our words. What that means is that many times... We are enduring something, and, and God's with us, and we're going through it, and we're enduring it, but we're sure not, uh, we sure, our face is sure it is, is moving a lot, and our words are coming out, and we're talking about how much we hate this, uh, why do we have to go through this, I don't know why God's doing this to us, we're just, I mean, we are just, and, and Proverbs says, you're snared by those words in your mouth. Paul says, look, here's how love operates. Love operates where when hard things happen, love's face doesn't move. If, I, if you're going to get credit for something, if you're going to go through hardship and you're going to get credit for it from God, which is what I would want to do, right? <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to endure through something hard, I would sure like for there to be a blessing on the other side. And if I make it through this hardness, it would be a great thing and God would bless my life. Well, if I do, I've got to do it without letting my face move. If I, as an example, if, if, if I'm up here teaching and Pastor Tanya uh, was at home and she said, uh, and I said, baby, I, I, I'm, I'm preaching something today. I, I really want you to be there. Can you be there? And she says, oh, well, I'm sick. I don't, I'm, I'm really not feeling like it. And I said, well, you know, I know that you are. And I, I, if you can't be there, you can't be there. But if you, if you can be there, I'd love for you to be there because I really want you to hear this. And I want you to be a part of it. And, and, and then she says, and then she looks at me and says, all right, I'll go. All right, and she comes in here and she sits down over there and she folds her arms like, and she's blowing about half time, and then that scowl on her face and looking at her, and you know, I'm going, but I ain't happy about it. Now, is 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 she going to get the blessing 
Oh, is she going to get the blessing of me looking at my wife and saying, babe, I know you were sick and I know that it was, you know, but you, I thank you for coming. You just were awesome and it was wonderful and great and I love you so much for all the sacrifice you have. And, uh, she's not getting any of that. Why? Because, because she's only here because I made her come and she lost all the blessing because she, I saw her face move. So love is love endures all things, and love doesn't let its face move. And then the final one is love never fails. Love works. <laughs> yeah, love works. It works. No matter how mean, no matter how nasty, no matter how obnoxious somebody is, love never fails. It's amazing how just a little practice of love towards somebody that is being uh, obnoxious, arrogant, uh, hard, difficult to deal with. Uh, it's amazing how it works in life. The Bible says that love always works that way. I mean, isn't that how God did us? The Bible says in Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. That means none of us, me, you, Billy Graham, the Pope, Mother Teresa, whoever it might be, that none of us are righteous. And it says the reason why in 323 is for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're not righteous because we're all sinners and we've come short of the glory of God. But 5.8, Romans 5.8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, while we were as sorry as we could possibly be, while we were Joe Rattlesnake, you know, God loved us. He didn't wait till we got cleaned up and looked nice and acted pleasant. God didn't wait until we got it all figured out and stopped rebelling against him and stopped running against him and became righteous seekers in our life. In the midst of as evil as we could possibly be, God showed his love for us and that Christ died for us when we were as wicked and evil as we could possibly be. And the Bible says the reason we love him is because he loves us. He first loved us, that's right, B. Yeah, in spite of ourselves, God loves us. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Love never fails. What we deserve, the wages, what are wages? Wages are what you earn for what you do. You work a week, you get a week's wages. You work for it, you earned it, you get it. For the wages of sin is death. What we deserve is death. What we've earned is death. But, and but always changes things, right? Got a big but right in the middle of it. <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so when we were as mean as Joe Rattlesnake or Joe Bad Breath Rattlesnake Jr., I mean, we were, we were, we were as ugly as we could possibly be. We're, I think of Yosemite Sam. We're the rooting, the tooting, the shooting, <laughs> you know, Outlaw varmint in the country. I mean, when we were as wicked and evil and non-caring and horrible as we could be, we didn't love God, we didn't know God, we didn't care about God, we didn't want God, we ran away from God as fast as we could run away. Love apprehended us. And it was the love of God that drew us to him so that we would now, because he's the king of our life, we love him, but we love him because he first loved us. And he did this because he loves us more than we love ourselves. And when we, did, when we had earned death, eternal separation from God, God gave us a gift. That's right. How do you get a gift? What, what, what do you do to get a gift? You, you don't earn a gift. If you earn it, it's wages. A, a gift means something I give you. And if I give it to you, how do you get it? 
You don't work for it. You don't pay me for it. You just take it. A gift is a gift and you just take it. And, and isn't, it, isn't it what God did for us? This great love never fails. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and he gave us the gift of salvation. That's why 1 Corinthians 13, this is the last verse of the chapter. And now by faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So love's greater than anything. Love's greater than preaching. Love's greater than praising. Love's greater than gifts. Love's greater than, than, than praying. Love's greater than even faith or hope. It's the greatest in the eyes of God. Love's everything. It's the foundation of all of our fruit and all of our life. And to God, it's everything. In Colossians, Paul says, above all else, he, he's given them a list of things to do, the church at Colossae. He said, now you need to do this. You need to practice this. And you need to take care of this. And you need to watch and handle this. And, 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 and it was doing all, these, all of these uh, 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 jobs and works and so forth. And then it says, and above all else, and above all else, put on love. Put it on. <laughs> that seems like a choice to me. Doesn't it to you? If I can put it on, <laughs> that means I can also put it off. It means I don't have to have it, but put it on, he says, because it is the greatest of all things. Love never fails.